everyone. Happy Monday. I hope your Monday is going well, and I hope you had a very restful and enjoyable weekend, or perhaps it was a productive weekend, uh, whatever suits your fancy. Uh, today, as usual, on Monday evening at this time, we have a wonderful show. Uh, but I'm excited about today's show because it covers an area that we don't talk about a lot in medicine. You know, I recall a time where I saw a patient in the hospital. Well, actually, I saw her in the office initially, and she was having some shortness of breath and fatigue. And, um, you know, these are common symptoms of cardiovascular disease. So what happened was I, you know, scheduled for a coronary angiogram procedure, and uh, so we took it to the hospital and, you know, we did the procedure. And the way you do a coronary angiogram, the patient lays flat on the table. Um, we uh, numb up the groin area. And, of course, you know, the, the veins and arteries that run through the legs run through the groin area. And typically what you do in a coronary angiogram, you put a catheter in the artery and you feed the artery up to the heart. Uh, and so, you know, we went ahead and did this. And, uh, of course, I was going to do another test that used the vein. Uh, so put an artery, a catheter in the artery, and a sheath for a catheter in the vein. Now, typically, when you uh, get blood from an artery, many of you take in biology or you know have a medical background, the blood in the artery, because it's oxygenated, is red. You know, usually bright red, but red. And of course, the blood in the vein is dark, dark blue. And so, typically, that's what we expect when we see. However, I placed a needle in the artery and got you know, flow, pulsatile flow back. So I know it was an artery, but the blood was black, really dark. Uh, so I put the catheter in and all, you know, quite surprising. So uh, I got a sample of both the venous blood sent off from arterial blood gas and and uh, we got some abnormal numbers. We did some other tests. To make a long story short, you know, we did the angiogram, we didn't see any blocked arteries. But what we found was that the patient had um, high amounts of carbon monoxide. And so, you know, we were, you know, curious as to why this happened. Of course, she just had come home to get the procedure done. So we let her stay in the hospital. And of course, the, the carbon monoxide level had decreased while she was in the hospital. Whereas it turned out, you know, we did a little bit of investigative work and we had her check her um, gas pipes and everything at home. And as it turned out, she had a significant gas leak in, at her house. Uh, of course, you know, she didn't realize this, but she was getting ill related to that. And uh, we discovered this uh, sort of by happenstance. So, you know, this was an eye opener for me, of course, because, you know, it was a clear example how, you know, the patient's home environment contributed to her illness. Well, we really actually have this factor in our health more than we know. Uh, there are a lot of things in our homes, uh, whether it's, you know, gas pipes or radon or or the chemicals we use to clean up floors and so on and so forth that has a major impact on our health. And this case I gave you was a uh, more drastic or more dramatic case. But many of us are affected by our home environment and it has long-term effects, whether it causes heart disease or cancer or liver disease or lung disease or the like. So, you know, in our whole quest to help our patients and empower our audience, uh, in learning about improving their overall health, you know, what you feed your body, which is your most local environment, you know, the food is important, but also other things that get into your body from your more immediate uh, uh, environment can have a big impact on your health. So what we're talking about tonight is creating a non-toxic home. And one can extrapolate that into creating a non-toxic home or non-toxic environment, whether that's your home environment, your work environment, or, or et cetera. So, you know, uh, we have one of our, our regulars, Dr. Floyd Act, is going to be leading this discussion. So I'm really excited, you know, to have this discussion tonight, and I really want you to stay tuned, and if those of you who just tuned in, uh, if you know some friends or whomever uh, who would benefit from this, please uh, you know, share this, because this is going to be very valuable information. Of course, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe especially if you enjoy what you're seeing, because you uh, will have more to come. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to bring a panelist in. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Pamela Atkins. Hello, Dr. Atkins. Dr. Atkins is our functional medicine doctor here in the Houston area, and uh, she sees uh, many patients and helps them reverse their lives using natural uh, approaches. She's uh, trained in allopathic medicine and has extensive 
experience in functional medicine uh, practice and uh, does a wonderful job with uh, men and women with hormone stabilization and uh, many uh, other areas of holistic medicine. Hey, good evening, Pam. How are you doing? And uh, and you're on mute, but we'll unmute you. And next okay. is good evening. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And next is uh, Celeste. Dr. Palmer is our resident uh, pediatrician, and she uses natural holistic approaches to help her patients uh, reverse illnesses. She does uh, uh, counseling for um, uh, kids and young adults uh, and help them uh, change their lifestyle. And uh, she works very hard in one of the large pediatric uh, medical clinics here in Houston, Texas, uh, children, and uh, she does a lot of work outside of that arena. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, Celeste, how are you today? Good. So I hope your Monday's going well. Um, it's all busy for all of us. So <laughs> it comes from work or some, from somewhere here to uh, share our knowledge with you. Without further ado, we have um, uh, both our guests and the regular panelists, uh, Dr. Floyd Atkins. Um, maybe you know Dr. Atkins, he's a graduate of Morehouse uh, College uh, and a graduate of Ohio College of Podiatric Medicine. Uh, he completed his residency and training at Kirkwood General Hospital in Detroit, Michigan in 1983. Was board certified in foot surgery in 1990 and was, was a lecturer and speaker. Uh, in 96, he entered the ministry and became an advocate of spiritual and physical wellness in the effort to connect the dots between the mind, body, and spirit. Uh, he retired from practice of bodyatric medicine in 2003 and now fully devotes his time uh, to the vision of preventing health uh, for toward preventive health care and wellness education. Uh, he currently pursues uh, his passion as an author, wellness educator, and consultant at the Center for Wellness and Healing here in Houston with Dr. Atkins. Uh, without further ado, welcome. Uh, Floyd, how are you today? Oh, doing wonderful. How are you doing? Good so, evening, everyone. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Right. You know, this whole um, issue of uh, the non-toxic home you know, you got to, you know, I got a quick glance at your slides, but, you know, this is going to be quite an uh, insightful show. There's a lot of information here, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and warn our listeners in the fact that, you know, this is going to be really packed with information, and, um, you know, we're going to try to, you know, break it down and uh, make it as straightforward as possible, but, you know, hopefully you have your notepads with you and uh, hopefully you'll go back over this uh, recording and, you know, pause it and make notes as we go. Because, you know, just looking at those slides and, you know, having had a discussion with you on this topic before, I know there's a lot here. Before you get into the nuts and bolts, what, what, what is your general sense of the toxins in our homes here in the United States from what you've seen? Is it... If you just have to categorize it as a kind of a minor, small problem, or B, somewhat of a medium problem, or C, a major problem that we need to do something about uh, as both individuals and uh, as a society. Well, you must have been following up uh, the research I've been doing lately because that was one of my questions too. And what I found out is at, that we're at a tipping point when it comes to toxic burden. We kind of uh, look at um, what's happening uh, as far as toxins in our environment as a as a uh, a burden load, and we want to know what our toxic load is because it directly impacts our immune system. It impacts how we feel. Uh, what we're coming to understand is that toxic burden is really one of the underlying causes of almost every systemic problem that we see in in uh, healthcare. Uh, I've did some research and it showed that about in everyone's household, you average about 62 different chemical toxins in your household every day. And these are things that are, are toxic to your body. They, they're, they're not compatible with human nature. Some people, and that's the average, some people as high as many as, as 129 different toxins in, their, toxins in their home environment. So, you know, there's a job to be do, done just to control that, uh, that volume. Um, you know, and, and, you know, from our shows before, you know, we always talk about uh, nutrition and health and wellness and food and diet. But what we're finding out and what we know is that um, health as well as sickness is multifactorial. It really takes all the, the blocks to be lined up in a row to get 
the, the, the best outcome. And so we, we ought to talk about area, like you said before, that's not really discussed because we kind of overlook it, thinking that if we eat properly, everything will be okay. I think I lost your volume. I muted myself. Okay. I apologize. As, as I was saying, um, what um, we often, you know, like you said, we often approach uh, patients from a factor of, you know, what they eat and so on and so forth. And of course, many of our colleagues in the allopathic field, you know, just look at their, you know, deficit of prescription medications and they leave it there. But, but um, I think it's uh, important to sort of look at the environment. And I'm trying to create a process by uh, questioning our patients about their home environment. How often are you outdoors? You know, what kind of air conditioning you have and so on. So I'm looking forward to learning from this talk so I can add to my, you know, insight and perspective in terms of evaluating my patients, because I'm sure uh, there's some things that we can learn and start to ask up front that's gonna get us there. So without further ado, I'm bring your slides up. And uh, if you could just take over, um, and uh, let's talk about creating a non-toxic home. Okay. Um, well, this this presentation is uh, really tries to cover it. Number one, I can't cover everything I would love to cover. We'd need several shows to do that. But I wanted to hit some key points that everyone should know because you know knowledge is power, and we need to have the power and understanding what's going on, and. Um, uh, toxicity is is one of the primary factors when it comes to uh, balancing our life, balancing our lifestyle for uh, spiritual, physical, and mental health. So I'm just going to kind of start off with a statement about what goes in our home. And I'm going to read a couple of things because it's important that I want people not only to see these slides, but hear what I'm saying, because it's so important to understand uh, what the problems are. It says, whether you have a serious health issue or not, you need to know what you are breathing and what you're absorbing through your skin. Your home is a storehouse of cleaning and personal care products loaded with chemicals. And these are toxic chemicals, chemicals that are unknown. A lot of the chemicals, that, they're unknown. And I'll explain that later. They're unnamed because they, they are derived when other chemicals come together. They're untested, especially for long-term health effects. A lot of the products on the market have never been tested only for short or acute effects, but not long-term. And finally, um, many of them have already proven to be harmful, but they're still on the market and they're still in products. Uh, but just to give you an idea of what's found in our indoor air, and I think, Bachelor, you alluded to this earlier, that the combustion products, these are products that are caused by uh, fuel and gas and wood and, and fumes that we burn in our home. And the number one thing on that list is carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide, carbon di uh, nitrogen dioxide. Those two are both toxic gases that we don't smell, we don't see, we don't taste, but they're there. They are causing a host of health problems that we may not even be aware of. Number two is tobacco smoke. Uh, it contains cyanide, lead, formaldehyde, arsenic, uh, uh, ammonia, benzene. And you know, just from research, it shows that 60% of people who are diagnosed with lung cancer have never smoked. So we wonder, well, how do you, if smoking is the number one cause of lung cancer, but 60% of people uh, develop cancer who are non-smokers, this is some of the reasons that we see that. Uh, radon is, is something that's, that's it's regional and rare, but radon is a gas that seeps out of the ground. It's, it's from um, a radioactive material in the earth but it also is a primary cause of lung cancer. So there are things going on that we may not be aware of, but we need to know. Floyd, that, uh, radon, is that very common in the Houston, Texas area? I'm just curious for our Houston listeners. Uh, it, it, it's not very common there. I don't know many people that do radon de detection. De detection. I know people have radon detectors in their households, but I haven't heard of any cases. I know in the Northeast, uh, I've seen uh, quite a few people, when I've seen people have been uh, having toxic exposure, that's that's where I'm familiar with it from. I haven't really had much um, impact or, or in the Houston area, especially in Texas. Uh, number four is lead, uh, especially in, in paint and water pipes, especially in old houses. 
and lead is especially harmful to young kids, low level exposure. And it has so many toxic effects, especially on mental development when it comes to kids. And, and we know just what's going on in, in, the, in the Flint area where they had the problem with the lead pipes and it's causing a toxic um, uh, impact on the whole population. Number five is organophosphates, which are basically the, the main chemical uh, base for pesticides. Uh, so very few people in America or in the world don't have some kind of insecticide killer in their household, whether it's a uh, um, insect repellent or whether it's a roach killer or a larger pest, they have some kind of pesticides. But most organophosphates are what we call neurotoxins. They are toxic to your nervous system. And you have to realize if they are toxic to the nervous system of pests, they're also toxic to the nervous system of human beings. It's just the amount of how long, how often, how much. Um, volatile organic compounds, that's the benzene, formaldehyde, and naphthalene, uh, which are, are the um, mothballs, but we're going to talk about that. But that's another chemical that we find in our house that uh, ends up creating a cloud or gas in our house. That's why there are a lot of uh, researchers feel that the household environment when your windows are closed is more toxic sometimes than the outside environment. Dr. Now, could you turn your... Uh uh, speaker down. I think uh, some of the listeners are hearing an echo. Okay. Okay. Is that better? Uh, yeah, so yeah. You still hear echo? That's yeah, better. Wait a minute. I'm, I really hear you. Um, okay. Um, one thing I want to cover here is, is this is something that we don't um, I guess we kind of take it for granted or we overlook it because, you know, it's a part of a society. It's called the microwave oven. And, uh, you know, microwaves themselves is a radiation, microwave radiation. And if, if we were exposed to radiation from any other source outside of a microwave, we would be concerned about it. Uh, you know, whether it was, you know, uranium or some kind of radiation in our household, because we know that ionizing radiation uh, and non-ionizing radiation are, are harmful to health. They can cause cancer and cause other diseases, other illnesses. Uh, it says microwave agitates molecules, which cause friction in the nature of the original makeup of foods. Uh, the result is that it destroys the minerals, it destroys the vitamins, the proteins, and it generates a compound in foods called radiolytic compounds. And that's what happens when you microwave things like eggs or bread and you leave it in the microwave too long. And what happens is that the texture or the composition of the food changes. I mean, eggs become rubbery, bread becomes like cardboard because actually the chemical structure of the food has changed. And the problem with that is that if the human being doesn't have the enzymes, the digestive ju juices to digest these new proteins, these new radiolytic compounds. And then we end up with things like uh, um, leaky gut syndrome or, or uh, gastritis or, or uh, gastric reflux, any kind of gastric irritation because your, your gastric system is rejecting, your digestive system is rejecting these compounds you're trying to put in for food. And I, I always say, well, once you microwave it, they're no longer food. But any, you have much data on this radiolytic compounds? You know, we at uh, at our center have, have spoken against microwaving since the beginning of time of doing, you know, lecturing about nutrition and wellness. And many of my colleagues in the um, you know plant based arena doesn't really differentiate. They say microwaving is okay. Uh, did you? I, I know you're going to give us some resources. Just a quick. You know, yeah. Did you find much on these radiolytic compounds? Well, you don't find too much on it unless you do uh, uh, um, research, because there's no much. It's not much research being done on it. They know that it changes the structure of food, and they call them radiolytic compounds because the radiation breaks down the natural bonds in the food and it connects other bonds together. And that's basically what happens. But you don't. They don't identify them. They don't name them. They don't have a. a um, a word for it. They just call it radiolytic compounds. So that's one of the challenges when it comes to microwaving. You know, we don't even challenge what microwaving does to food since, since it's been around. Uh, we know that if you're eating food that's, that's void of nutrition of the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants that have been changed, that is going to decrease your immune response, your immune system. And I think 
you know, the multifactorial of all these things that are coming to, together to destroy our immune system is what's really causing the sicknesses, the the um, the effects of viruses in our society, uh, the effect of cancer in our society, the effect of autoimmune disorders in our society. All these things come together because it all goes back to immunity. It's like having a house and you just turn off your security system or disable your security system so you have no protection for any outside sources. Um, uh, and, and, and there's no specific research. I look for data to find out about how um, microwaving will affect human health, but it, it's, it has an indirect effect because it really interferes with your food source, with the food you're eating. I just showed a couple of uh, pictures to the left. It says, when you have a microwave, especially in the workplace, you have to have the sign that says microwave oven in use. You have to warn people because it's dangerous. Number one, microwaves leak. We don't always check them to see if they're leaking. We know that it affects the food. At the bottom picture, I have a picture of two plants. These are uh, some sixth graders who did a, a, a uh, scientific experiment to show that they actually microwave water. At one time, I would tell people, only thing you should put, put in the microwave is water. But they did this experiment where they put microwave water in the plant on the left and put regular tap water on the plant on the right. And the plant on the left, after three weeks, was dying from uh, use of the microwave water. So that was a test that's uh, just a basic science experiment. But you don't see any an official test on the market. Now what we on your body, and we want to consider dry cleaning. Something again, we don't consider. We don't consider the, the fluid in dry cleaning. It's a volatile organic compound of VOC. These are things we breathe. They they absorb right through our skin, and they are a cause of a, a, a number of a health problems. But it's called per perchloroethylene. Uh, and that particular compound in most dry cleaning fluids is banned in California, uh, Massachusetts, and, and they're trying to get rid of it in Texas, but who knows? Dr. Dr. Atkins, I have a question, because you know the California warning is on a lot of things, from suitcases to comforters to yes. everything. Um, so I'm just wondering, and I know, I know about the law in California, but how dangerous is it for something that is like a suitcase that you're not literally, um, your clothes are going in it, but you're, you won't have close contact with it necessarily. What, do you think that, that is something to stay away well, from? Well, I, I consider it a big deal because number one, when you come bring your clothes from the dry cleaners, they're in a plastic bag and it actually the, the compounds are not allowed to evaporate. It would be good to take those clothes out, hang them outside for a day or two to let the, the, those chemicals, they are very volatile, they, they will evaporate very rapidly. And then you could get rid of them because breathing it is, is, is dangerous as it, uh, touching your skin. And if you leave them in your closet and you open up the, that, uh, those gases accumulate in your closet and they stay there permanently. And so, yeah, you wanna, you wanna take some steps like letting it air out, I would much rather you choose clothes that didn't require dry cleaning because, again, you bring in uh, toxic chemicals into the environment and that could be a, a problem long term. Uh, this is one of the, the areas when it comes to what we put in our body that, that people fight with me on because we talk about fabric softeners because everybody wants to be downy fresh and they want to they want to bounce and they want to smell good. And I have to throw things like um, Febreze or renews it of those chemical uh, fragrance into this category also. Uh, fabric softeners are, are some of them, it was listed as some of the most toxic products made for daily household use. So out of everything we have in our household during the day, uh, these um, fabric softeners are, are at the top of the list. And they contain the most toxic chemical, chloroform. It, they use it, you know, in, in when we used to do biological biology in, in med school when we kill animals in, in undergrad, we use chloroform to, to kill the animals to, to do dissection. Uh, uh, benzoyl acetate, pentane, all of those are very toxic organic chemicals. Um, some, some, some of the, uh, there's some brands like Seventh Generation that has those fabric softeners. Yes. Uh, and they suppose you use natural things. Are they exempt or are they just as toxic as say a bounce or one of the other ones? Well, well, they are better, and, and, and seventh generation is probably the ones that, that are better than most. Uh, but you have to be able to to look at the ingredient label on most of them. 
the, the thing about most of them, they don't list the toxic ingredients. They don't list the most toxic things on the labels because a lot of them are considered impurities or they're considered a byproduct of the making up of the product. So, uh, but we know, and I'm, I'm going to get to the slide next, what they cause. I mean, they cause hormone disruption, disruption. They're neurotoxic. They're immunotoxic. They have so many effects on our on, on human health. Uh, that's really where the problem is. So seventh generation takes some of those things out. Um, and I think that's a safer choice to um, to look at. I don't know if Dr. Pamela has a, a way in on that. Yeah, and and um, you can use uh, essential oils. You can put it on like a handkerchief and, and toss that in your dryer with your clothing. Um, you know, those that can hang up their clothing outside, they have weather like we do in Houston, warmer weather, longer, you know, you can, it's, it naturally can keep your fabrics a little softer that way, but we don't need a softener, but if you want your clothes to smell better, essential oils. Okay, and uh, let me. Uh... Essential oils in the dryer or just put them on after they're dry? Just put on a handkerchief or a cloth and just to, just to put a few drops and toss it with your clothes. Oh, and wow. you can do and you can do the same thing to freshen up something instead of taking it to the cleaners. If it doesn't necessarily have spots, you just want to freshen it up. You can toss it with your favorite essential oil, you know, with the cloth in there. In the dryer. Wow. And it and, works pretty well. Yes. And non-toxic cleaners. There are some ec ecologically or non-toxic cleaners uh, that if you must clean a suit or some uh, clothing that uh, needs to be cleaned. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and, and to point this out to, to, to the audience, they understand sometimes we have symptoms that we go to see our doctors for and the symptoms are all originating in our household. We think we can get diagnosed with a disease or people have symptoms and they can't come with a diagnosis, but we have to look at things in our environment that's causing those symptoms. Uh, symptoms caused by fabric softener fumes are tiredness that's not cured by resting, uh, difficulty breathing, nervousness, for no known reasons, difficulty concentrating or remembering, dizziness, headaches, sick stomach, faint feeling, rashes, difficulty controlling your uh, body movements. Um, and sometimes these dangers can be permanent. So we have to really uh, make a decision about you know, what, we're, what our environment uh, contains. Also in our bodies, we're talking about mineral oils, we talk about uh, paraffins and petroleum. And, you know, I put these uh, label, I want to show people pictures because these are things we have in our household every day. Maybe not the raw kind of jelly, that kind of dates me, but the other, the Vaseline and the Johnson uh, baby oil. Uh, and, and it says right on the label, it says pure petroleum jelly. So it's telling you from the very beginning, it's a chemical that is a petroleum jelly. It's, it's a byproduct of uh, making diesel fuel and gasolines, and it's a leftover, and they purify it and make it into a, a grease or a jelly and someone decided it was good for skin but um, petroleum products uh, that coat the skin clog the pores create a buildup of toxins accumulate and can lead to dermolo dermatological issues uh, slows the development which causes early signs of aging and it's suspected of causing cancer but definitely a disruptive of hormonal activity I want to go a few more. I'm going to move a little fast because it's a lot of information to cover, but I want you to see these pictures and understand because these are products we use every day and we're accustomed to. Another chemical that we see uh, is called sodium laurate, sodium laurel or laurel uh, sulfate, sodium laurel sulfate, SLS. And, and that's really a foaming agent. It, it, you know, it's, it's the foaming agent they put in toothpaste, it's the foaming agent they put in detergents, it's the foaming agent they put in shampoos to give you a lot of lather. People want that. Um, but the, actually it's used, it's found in car washes because they have a lot of foam there. Uh, engine degreasers in mechanic shops, they use it on garage floors to clean, clean grease up off the floors. But they also use the agent for us to put in our mouth and put on our hair and put on our skin. Uh, uh, but we know that it breaks down those foaming agents over time, breaks down the skin's moisture barrier and allows other chemicals, chemicals to more easily penetrate. And so, uh, and then the, the most, the most lethal thing is that the, they combine with other chemicals and they form what we call a nitrosamine. And a nitrosamine, if you check with the Center for Disease Control, with the carcinogenic agents, you'll see that it's a potent carcinogen. And so again, when people 
develop cancers that are strange or unknown or no history or predilection for those types of cancer, we can see exactly where they originate from. Uh, Diozane is another one found in a chemical called PEG. When you look at shampoos, especially baby shampoos, a lot of nail polishes, you'll see PEG PEG or polysorbates. And those are those are chemicals that we don't know what they are, but the dioxin is the, is the mix of these chemicals. And, and that is known to be a, a carcinogenic agent. It's been determined as a carcinogenic agent since 1965 uh, by the National Cancer Institute uh, in 78. But again, they're still in products. You have to know what you're using. You want to make safer choices. And again, I, I don't want everybody to think I'm a bearer of bad news. We're going to talk about uh, a lot of solutions here that we can turn to when we get into the second part of our, our, our show here. Uh, we're going to cover acrylamides. Acrylamides are found in hand creams and face creams. Uh, they're linked to mammary tumors in lab research, you know, uh, it's, and, and I will talk a little bit more about that. But one slide I want to really cover with you right here, this slide covers a lot of things, but it's a lot of information here. So bear with me for a minute. In the middle of the slide, the color picture shows two heads, a uh, head on the left and a head on the right. And that's a thermographic image, a thermal image of a person who uh, will look like uh, normally, and after talking 15 minutes on a cell phone, the image on the right in the center is what their thermal uh, appearance of their skin and hair looks like. And we know that the radiation given, given off by cell phones, which is another device in our environment, our home environment that we just kind of overlook. Uh, it heats up our brain tissues and causes uh, a host of problems. Um, there's not a lot of research again because they refuse to do research. They, you know, when you talk about cell phone radiation or electromagnetic radiation, and we've covered this before, uh, they say it's not enough research. But no one is willing to do the research because they don't want to. Um, they don't want to have the answers that will change the industry. Up in the upper left-hand corner shows a baby using a cell phone up against his head. One of the most dangerous things we can do for our kids is let them handle cell phones because cell phone gives out radiation about two feet away from the cell phone, the radius. If you look at their package inserts on cell phones, it says that it's not supposed to come within six centimeters of your head when you use it. So technically, you should always use it on speaker or you should use, have a um, earpiece to use it because once you put it up your head, it, 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 it heats up brain tissue. Uh, with kids, they have thinner skulls, so it heats up their brain tissue even more than an adult. So it's even worse. Right below the kid, I showed three young ladies, which is very popular with, with the uh, young teens and preteens, of putting cell phones in their back pocket. And again, if you're radiated, if you have 4G or 5 gigahertz worth of radiation, up to with the 5G, you go to 60 to 200 to 60 gigahertz of radiation given off by that cell phone, even when you're not talking on it. Uh, you're radiating your, your, your pelvic area, your ovaries, you're radiating your uterus, you're radiating um, your entire pelvic area. For men, it's a prostate and testes. Um, Wi-Fi, we'll talk about another day, but Wi-Fi radiation is another pollutant that's in our environment. Up in the upper right-hand corner, I have a picture of a singer. This is Cheryl Crow, for people who know uh, Cheryl Crow is a singer. Well, in 2012, she was diagnosed with a, a hemangioma, a, a brain tumor, and she didn't know what was going on, and she would try to sing a song. She would even forget the lyrics to her own songs, and she had an MRI, and she was diagnosed with having a hemangioma. She had uh, multifocal tumors in her brain on the same side of, the, of her, of her that she used a cell phone. And her doctors wouldn't say she was sick from cell phone usage, but she said herself she knows that spending eight to ten hours a day on a cell phone was really the cause. She really felt that caused her because it, it bothered her to use a cell phone, and she 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 uh, used that. I show a couple of little um, sperm cells below her because uh, it definitely will affect with your sperm count when it comes to uh, chronic radiation. And on the very bottom, there's a. a an image that says, save the girls. Doctors warn that usual that unusual breast cancers are occurring in women who store cell phones in their bras. Another popular thing that women do because they didn't always have a place to carry their cell phones, they can stick them in their bra, they stick them in, in, in uh, their clothing this way. And this is a very, very dangerous thing to do. And for those who are skeptical about that, let's look at some research here. This was a research that was done in 2013. And I had to look this up because I wanted to, to, to show that this is this is not something that is uh, conspiracy theory. 
uh, multifocal breast cancer in young women with prolonged contact with their breasts and their cell cellular phones. And this is an abstract. I want to read a little bit of it because it's so important. I want women to understand this. I want men to understand this because if with women with breast cancer, also men, if you carry it in your, your coat pockets, if you carry it in your pants pocket, again, you, you're susceptible. It says breast cancer is occurring in women under the age of 40. It's uncommon in the absence of family history or genetic deep uh, predisposition and prompts the exploration of other possible exposures or environmental risks. Uh, we report a case series of four women ages 21 to 39 with multifocal invasive breast uh, cancer that raised concerns of the possibility associated with non-ionizing radiation of electromagnetic fields from cell phone exposures. All patients regularly carried their cell phones, their smartphones directly against their breast in their brassiers for up to 10 hours a day for several years and developed tumors in the area that their breasts immediately underlying the cell phones. All patients had no family history of breast cancer, tested negative for BRCA1 and BRCA2, and had no other known breast cancer risk. Their breast cancer imaging was reviewed, showed clusters of multi-tumor foci in the breast directly under the areas of the cell phone. Uh, pathology of all four cases showed striking similarities. All tumors are hormonal, were hormone positive, low uh, intermediate grades, having an extensive intraductal component. And all the tumors have uh, nearly identical morphology. And so it's not a coincidence that this kind of thing happens. And I wanted the people to to, I want uh, the audience and people to understand that that this is a serious thing we have to we have to consider. Uh, but this is just an, but it's no more research when it comes to men and prostate, when it comes to men and testicular cancer, when it comes to men and um, sexual impotence, or or it comes to um, infertility. Uh, it's 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 a problem, but we don't have the research. Uh, finally, I want you to know these things when it comes to toxics and non toxic. We have to watch out for marketing, uh, words on the packaging like natural um, and our, our, our marketing terms. I mean, uh, hemlock is natural and uh, plutonium and, and uranium is natural, but they will both kill you. Um, non-toxic plant-based. Just because it says non-toxic and plant-based, you have to be aware of every other chemical, byproduct, additive, um, artificial color, artificial flavor that may also be in that product. When you see something that says free and clear, well, water is free and water is clear, but again, and it could have toxic chemicals in it that take away your body. A safer choice. And so if it's a safer choice, what is what was it before? Oh, 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 safer than what is my question. Uh, words like botanical. Uh, botanical means it comes from plants, but does that mean it also has the pesticides, the herbicides, the fungicides? Uh, on it also that we're getting. So you have to want to make sure that you can get it organic as much as possible. We know it's chemical and pesticide free. Um, made from sensitive, made for sensitive skin. Well, I consider my skin sensitive. I think every all skin is sensitive, but when it's made for sensitive, sensitive skin, uh, you know, you want to know what that means. Uh, green or eco-friendly. Uh, we want to know that it's, if it's echo friendly, does it mean it's also chemo friendly? Does it have chemicals in it also? Uh, but 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 don't get trapped on marketing terms. Um, there are a couple of things I want to go through real quick because I know we we're we're going to be short on time. But I want to cover seven chemicals that I want all the audience to know about listeners because these are the most important chemicals when it comes to personal care products that's in our society, that's in our environment that we are focused on every day. One is called triclosan. Uh, it's a hormone disruptor. Synthetic musk are the chemicals, are the fragrances or that we smell that are made from chemicals that they put in perfumes and cosmetics. Uh, formaldehyde, uh, it's, a, uh, it's um, used as an embalming fluid. It's a, a chemical that kills uh, most bacteria and everything, but it, it is, you know, we know it's a carcinogen. It causes cancer. Nitrosamine is, again, a carcinogen and immunotoxic. Parabens, uh, the cancer and endocrine disruptors. Uh, phthalates, and I need to really talk about that, reproductive disruptions, and uh, other lead and other heavy metals that are problems. Uh, so back to how we do it on time. I have a, a just, I need about 
three minutes to go through these, is okay? Yeah, that's fine, go ahead. Okay. Uh, triclosan, now triclosan is a chemical that's found in most hand sanitizers. The, the prels of hand sanitizers that they came out early in the 2000s and, two, uh, and uh, after, they had triclosan in it, and triclosan was supposed to be a potent antibacterial product. Uh, we see it in detergents, we see it in deodorants, we see it in toothpastes, we see it in everything. But triclosans themselves have an impact on thyroid function and thyroid homeostasis. So they affect your thyroid balance is, is number one. And they also disrupt hormone, other hormones. But the thing about it, what bothered me was that in 2005, the FDA found that Evidence, found no evidence that the antibacterial washes that, clean, that contain triclosan was superior to plain soap and water. So while we're paying money for these hand sanitizers that that uh, have the triclosan in them as a as a superior agent, they said plain soap and water was more effective or as effective as they were. Uh, synthetic must. And, and we use the term must, but they, they label it that way. It's not really must because it's, it's really from a chemical source. Uh, they're poorly studied class of chemicals. It's added to cosmetics, perfumes, lotions, um, but they disrupt hormones also. They, they trigger skin uh, sensitization, uh, sensitizing your skin to UV light. Uh, they are identified as fragrances that found in, in the cord blood of newborn. So everywhere you go, you're gonna find a synthetic must. One, one thing I wanna say about the must product is that almost all perfumes use these chemicals as base. They might have 20 or 30 or 40 different chemicals in them that makes up that fragrance that we smell. And they make it that way because they want the fragrance to be strong. They want to be long lasting. So say for instance, if you go to an event or a ball and you get off there, you get on the elevator and other people are getting off the elevator and you feel a, a smell of a strong perfume, whether it's obsession or eternity or whatever it is. But those chemicals are having a toxic effect on our body because those uh, fragrances are hormone disruptors. Uh, it shows here that the um, chronic exposure uh, are linked to uh, low blood cell count, uh, kidney liver damage, because those are detoxifying organs that have to detoxify those chemicals out of our body. Uh, they also uh, are affect the reproductive health. So, you know, when people are young people, and we see so many people today that have difficulty conceiving children, but there's so many toxins in the environment that are interfering with hormone balance that it, it uh, is a uh, hindrance. Formaldehyde. With formaldehyde, uh, it, it, again, it's a danger sign that goes with that. It says an irritant, potential cancer hazard, and it's, 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 on, it's not authorized for personal use is really what it says. But they're used in shampoos and body soaps. Um, and it's mainly because any product that has water in it has to have a preservative in it to kill bacteria. The government mandates that. And someone decided that formaldehyde was a good one. Not whether it was uh, uh, harmful to human health, but it killed the bacteria. But if it kills the bacteria, again, you have to realize that it killed the human being too. Uh, formaldehyde is used in mouthwash, if you can believe it nail polish, nail glues, eyelash, hair gels, baby shampoos, and we're putting formaldehyde on the babies, uh, body washes. The European Union and Canada restricts the use of formaldehyde in personal care items. It's banned in Japan and Sweden. It's oh, still okay here in the U.S. Formaldehyde is considered a probable car carcinogen by the EPA and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, but it's still allowed to be in a product as a, um, as a um, preservative or is it, uh, is, um, a bactericidal. Nitrosamines, we talked about this earlier. Nitrosamines are a group of compounds. They're usually byproducts of chemicals that are put together to make up a, a cosmetic or make up a lotion. When you put several chemicals together, they they have byproducts and nitrosamine is one of the number one byproducts we see. Um, and it, it's listed on the label as impurities. You don't even see nitrosamines on the label because they don't Put them on the label that way. Just call it impurities. That you maybe say ninety-seven percent pure and you know three percent impurities. And these are the impurities that is what gets you. Uh, but we see it's found in nearly every kind of uh, personal care item, including mascaras, concealers, conditioners, baby shampoos, uh, pain relief salves, sunless tanning lotion. Uh, nitrosamines are in everything, and we really have to be careful about it. Studies show that uh, numerous study databases link nitrosamines to cancer. So again, cancer is has been a scourge for the last 50 years and outside it grows every year. No matter what we do, it's still increasing, but it's because 
of what we're doing ourselves is not um, it's not just falling out of the sky. Uh, they're listed by possible carcinogens by the EPA and the International Agency on Cancer Research. Nitrosamines are uh, toxic to reproductivity, immunotoxicity, uh, neurotoxicity, and systemic toxicity. So it affects a lot of things. So, uh, and we will, I have to give you more information. That's a whole uh, lecture just about nitrosamines. Parabens, the parabens, you've heard of methylparaben and, and polyparabens. Parabens are, are really parahydroxybenzoic acid or benzoate. If you look at any beverage, if you look at any candy bar, if you look at almost all substances, you'll see benzoate on there. Benzoate is a preservative that keeps to maintain freshness in foods. It keeps foods from spoiling. So it's I, it's, I call it embalming fluid for food. And it's almost in, in any cosmetic, it's in any... Uh, uh, shampoos, foods, every place because they, the the government has allowed that to be used as a way to preserve foods. And it's it's not for health, it's for preserving foods so they won't lose as spoilage and they lose money. Para, parabens appear in personal care products that contain water, such as shampoos, conditioners, lotion, face and shower cleansers and scrubs. Uh, they're estimated that 13,000 cosmetics uh, contain parabens. Um, over 50 international toxicity database indicate parabens are linked to cancer, endocrine disruption, uh, reproductive toxicity, immunotoxicity, neurotoxicity, and skin irritation. So we have all of these ingredients coming together that are having the same impact on our health and our body can only fight so many off. So that's why we are succumbing to a lot of these uh, ailments and diseases that we go to the doctor to get treated for, and there are really no medicines for that. We can treat symptoms, but we can't really treat the underlying cause until we uh, treat, address the toxic overload or toxic burden that our bodies are carrying. Parabens are known to disrupt hormone functions, and they're linked uh, to breast cancer risk and reproductive toxicity. Um, phthalates. Phthalates are softeners. This is number six. I only got a couple more to go. It's a softener that's put in plastic to make things unbreakable. That, that they make things stretch and 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 uh, not break. And uh, it was determined as a good thing. But they're responsible for the vinyl shower. When you go into a shower and they have vinyl shower curtains, you can always smell that shower curtains real strong. Or when you buy a new car, you call that new car smell. Well, those are uh, uh, butyl and ethyl phthalates that you're smelling. And those chemicals are definitely hormone disruptors. They put them in fragrances because they help the fragrance disperse in the air very rapidly. They put them in detergents. They put them in, and because it helps, it makes the the bounty and the and the fabrics go across the room very rapidly. They have dispersed the smell, so you have the smell, which is a problem. The fragrance, but you also have the phthalates that's in there is a problem too. They're in cleaning products because cleaning products don't always have a good smell, but they always add a chemical to them. Uh, one of the number ones I always look at is a fabuloso. A lot of people use that as a cleaner, but just opening the bottle can be toxic to your health. Some people get headache and get dizzy just from opening the bottle and smelling those those kind of fragrances. Um, they also found in medical products and wall coverings and detergents and nail polishes. If they're found everywhere. Even when it comes to our children and baby pacifier, this is a pacifier, seems so innocent, but the fact that it's soft and chewable is loaded with phthalate. And phthalate is, again, it's a hormone disruptor. And so we're starting up our kids at a young age. We're, we're damaging their immune system. We're uh, setting up for a hormonal uh, dysregulation and risk for you know, liver, pancreatic, testicular, uh, mammary tumors just from chewing on phthalates or ingest, ingesting them into our bodies. To go even further, a study uh, by the U.S. Uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention showed that Everybody, they, they tested 289 people for dibutyl phthalate, and they found that every one of them had it in their bodies. So everybody tested. This is one uh, prevalent phthalate that everybody, it, it was no, and nobody tested or was, was negative for this. So it's, it's, plastics are so prevalent in our society, and they're so prevalent in our food and what we breathe and what we put on our skin and what we have in our home and in our clothing. It's everywhere. Um, phthalates exposed. In a pregnant woman, this is important now for pregnant women out there, for women in general. Phthalates exposed in pregnant women has been associated with a shortening of the distance between the anus and the genitals in male babies, indicating a feminization 
uh, had occurred during the generative development. And these phthalates, uh, the dibutyl phthalates are called gender benders because they actually affect uh, the, 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 the gender um, orientation of fetuses. Uh, it was a study done by the International Journal of Andrology, which is studies men's health. Uh, that says, can these household chemicals crush your son's masculinity? Elevated levels of two plastic softening chemicals in pregnant women, pregnant women's urine are linked to less masculine play behavior by their sons several years later, according to a study published in the International Journal of Andrology. And I read this and I, it was it was amazing to me. I know that you know, we talk about it being a, affect reproductive health and how it affects us. And, you know, it made me think of a, of a, of a song that Lady Gaga sang is when she said, uh, I was born this way. Uh, she had a real popular song. And I always thought, you know, that was not necessarily true. But when you look at the research, when you look at what the chemical industry is doing to our reproductive health and development, you might say this is very well true because it, 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 the links are here. The, the research is so established that it's already out there. Uh, lead and other heavy metals. Most people know what heavy metals are. The lead, the arsenic, the mercury, the aluminum, the zinc, the chromium, the iodine, they all are found in cosmetics, especially lipsticks, toothpastes, eyeliners, but they all have a toxic effect. That's why we need to detoxify from heavy metals as much as possible. Uh, chemicals applied to our skin and so many others that uh, are dangerous when we, that we, um, well, what, what I want to say in this slide is that we apply chemicals to our skin. What happens is those chemicals go directly through our skin. 40% of what you put in your skin is directly absorbed into your bloodstream. So in fact, uh, putting chemicals on your skin is more deadly than eating them because when you eat them, you can have what we call a first pass effect where your stomach can break them down and you don't get the full effect of the chemical. But when you put them on your skin, they go through your skin, 40% directly into your bloodstream, and then you'll have an immediate uh, impact. So just want to point out what the what our challenges are and we really want to talk about some of the solutions that's great that's outstanding and uh you know what i'm going to do is uh take a quick uh station break and i'm gonna um uh warn our, our listeners we're gonna go maybe a few minutes over not too long but this is very important stuff so uh every minute's important so let's take a quick station break we'll be right back So I imagine all of you sitting back there, your eyebrows are up to your uh, hairline. Of course, my hairline so far, my eyebrows has a long way to reach, but then even be that as it may, you know, very insightful information. A lot of questions in the chat about solutions. And uh, part two, we're gonna talk about solutions. So without further delay, I'll bring our panelists back in. Uh, Dr. Foy, everybody. So. So we got a lot of questions about uh, solutions, what are good products and so on. And so uh, I think you have a lot of this in your slide and we'll kind of throw some questions out toward the end. So, you know, you've already scared us. Uh, uh, <laughs> now, uh, help us out in terms of, uh, you know, getting us to, to a safer environment. Okay. Well, a couple of key points, first of all. And um, one thing I want to, um, point out here is that, and this is just the key points, we want to we want to get the microwaves out. If we can do that, especially not microwaving in plastic, because when you microwave in plastic, you force the phthalates and the chemicals in the plastic into your food. And so even though people say, they, the companies say that microwave safe, as far as I'm concerned, nothing is microwave safe. Number two, organic products as much as possible. You'll cut out so many chemicals out of your environment, out of your life just by buying uh, organic. Organic is not 100% chemical free, but it may be 98% or 97% as, as opposed to just eating uh, conventional food, which is full of pesticides. Cut the petroleum, the mineral-based oil products out of your life. You know, if you want to have a, an ingredient, uh, use the natural oils. Like if you, again, if you can't eat it, you shouldn't put it on your body. 
olive oil, coconut oil, shea butter, almond butter, jojoba oil, whatever works for you, use those things. Use the natural deodorants. There are a lot of natural deodorants. I want the audience to go out and do some research because this is your life and you know, you, you not just getting a list. I have some things here, but I want you to, to do some research. Avoid fragrances. Again, like Dr. Pamela mentioned, rather than using fragrance, use essential oils. You have the oil, citrus oil, you have uh, 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 different oils, um, essential oils that are great fragrances that, that are as effective and you can smell so clean and fresh and wonderful. Avoid toxic cleaning products. Uh, Vaccine, we mentioned seventh, seventh generation. Um, a lot of companies now are coming out with um, uh, lines of organic products. I mean, and the Kroger has their line. But again, I urge people to read the labels, look for some of the chemicals we talked about and then make sure those are not there. One thing again is totally overlooked when it comes to uh, feminine hygiene is the, uh, the, the the feminine hygiene products that uh, the cottons and the materials they use off are either bleached and chlorine or either have pesticides. You want to use a natural, uh, a product by natural companies are more healthier products because this is something that you put in your body and you want to make sure that it's not going to be toxic. One recommendation we, we offer, especially at the Center for Wellness and Healing, is that to do periodic saliva testing to know what your hormone levels are, to see if your hormones need to be balanced. Sometimes people go to the doctor and they're, they're taking medications and really just have a hormone, hormonal imbalance that can be addressed and solve their problems. Now, here's some resources here I want to give people. Um, the Environmental Working Group has a list um, called of healthy cleaning products. Uh, you can actually, now if you have products that you're concerned about, that you, you use and you think they're great, you can go in and they have over 13, a database of over 13,000 uh, cleaning products. You can type the name of your cleaning product in there and see how they rate it from A to F to see uh, based on what's in it. And so they've done the research, they have the data, all you have to do is, 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 is look at it and see what works for you. There's another website called uh, Earth Easy. Now, that's for people who really want to get into formulating their own cleaning products. You can make your own. You can buy some that's pre-made. But if you want to really be diligent about it, for, for those who love doing this, uh, they have so many formulas and recipes to make your own uh, healthy cleaning products. Uh, Earth Easy. But if you write down these names, you, you the websites are there. And then a campaign for safe cosmetics. They have two websites I have there. But if you go to campaign for safe cosmetics, uh, you can find the healthy uh, products, healthy makeups, healthy uh, eyeliners and nail polishes and things like that. You don't, you know, there's always a solution to the problem. And so uh, these are some of the first steps you should take. Safer options for nail polish and nail polish remover. There's a website for that also. And uh, when it comes to, to hair dye, hair coloring, there are a number of of options, the naturalhairdye.com. If you go to that website, you have a list of all of these other companies that that provide natural hair dye, provide solutions to uh, you know for women who like to dye their hair, or, um, and and I guess we talk about a little bit about that. But those are some of the solutions for that because we hair dye again is a, a, a uh, the chemicals are very toxic, and you put them on your scalp. Your scalp is the most absorbent. Uh, area of skin on your body. I mean, uh, it will absorb almost everything. So you have to be very careful about what you're putting on your scalp. Um, and men, and men, men die there. Oh, and <laughs> men. So I'm, I'm gonna stop right here. Uh, uh, what I wanna share is if you, uh, on the websites, these are the kind of things you will find on the website for the audience to, to kind of look at when they talk about substitute for kitchen and bath, you know, baking sodas, borax, cornstarch, using isopropyl alcohol as a disinfectant. And, you know, like the baking soda, you can use it as, as a, a scouring agent. It deodorizes, you can put out grease fires with it. Uh, you can use it to uh, even remove stains. And, you know, we, we grew up using it as an underarm deodorant or uh, even as a toothpaste with moderation. Uh, borax is a, deodor a deodorizer, but it kills the growth of mildew and mold, uh, great, uh, boost for cleaning for soap, but also you can use it and mix it with sugar and, and use it as a pesticide. It kills cockroaches. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. so a so window cleaner, nail uh, polish, isopropyl alcohol. You know, they, they, every point in the government now they recommends using seventy percent isopropyl alcohol as and for your hand sanitizers. Lemon juice is great, and a lot of the audience knows these things. And and I would I could go into detail about that, but, but all this information is available on websites on especially the websites we mentioned earlier, 
but you can find how uh, how uh, you can use it as um, safe substitutes because you can substitute almost anything chemical. You can find a natural or less toxic substitute. And I want to encourage our audience to, you know, later on, of course, go back through this uh, presentation. Your, your slides are wonderful and lots of information. And, you know, this is a very, very you know, pregnant topic. And as you go through these, you know, I really want to encourage the, the, the audience to go through and, you know, pause the thing, do screen savers and all, because there's a lot of good information here. And and some things may apply more to some individuals than others. But, but I think it, it, all of this pretty much applies to us. You know, we, uh, as you go through your slides, I'm going to throw up a couple of questions as we get toward the end. You know, this is an interesting question from Karen Evans um, about uh, I need a safe sunscreen. And I guess the question is, is there a safe sunscreen? Should we be using sunscreen <laughs> as you go through your slides? And keep going through those slides. I want everybody to have uh, a look at those slides as you go through, because even though we're talking about questions, they can at least go back and, and uh, freeze the uh, presentation and make notes on these slides. So if you can keep going to these slides for it, that'd be great. Anybody want to address that question about the sunscreen? Yeah, I, I'd like to say um, the sunscreens seem to be safer ones made with minerals like zinc oxide. They may be a little thicker, um, but a, a lot of sunscreens are not healthy for uh, the environment are not healthy for the marine animals and uh, kind of leave um, uh, ring around the uh, swimming pool, etc. So um, there are more clothing that that and bathing suits and tops that you can that can be used as you know for sun protection and hats and other things or to minimize your your um, your time in the sun, but there are some non less toxic ones at the health food store to choose from. Now, there's a question earlier about from Patrice about hand sanitizers. Uh, what brand would you use, or would you recommend avoiding it all altogether? On the hand sanitizers, so would y'all just recommend not using hand sanitizer? I saw someone online. Uh, get hand sanitizers and and uh, and uh, light a match to the plate. <laughs> and so <laughs> well, well, I was going to say that. Yeah, hand sanitizers. I think you know, um, if you use a basic hand sanitizer, what we what we really use is a uh, grapefruit seed extract. So it's a uh, grapefruit seed extract is a natural antiviral, antifungal, uh, antibacterial. And it's made from this uh, as the seed of a citrus, uh, citrus fruit, and and it's a it's a potent. It's not toxic to your body. Again, it's something that you can eat. It won't harm you, and you, you can dilute it with water. You can buy a grapefruit seed extract. Um, there are some on the market, but usually dilute it with water if you get a concentrate, and it makes an excellent hand sanitizer. Um, I know they recommend alcohol, but a lot of the others on the market that you buy at the uh, Walmarts and stores like that. Who knows what chemicals in those things? Wow, wow. Well, uh, I want everybody in the audience to give uh, Dr. Atkins a, a digital round of applause. This has been an outstanding presentation. And, and, and as always, I learned a lot from your presentation. But this is very important because, you know, we have lots of toxins in our environment. And, you know, it has a big impact. And, and, and as Dr. Atkins alluded to, you know, we go to our doctors and they say, oh, I've got this problem and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, a lot of it's related to the environment. And, you know, doctors are so busy and they're hardworking. And oftentimes you have a sniffle or whatever, we'll just write a prescription for, you know, sniffle prescription or whatever prescription. And, and really it takes some time to clean up your environment. And this is the process over time. We don't expect all of you to go out and then just sort of, you know, get rid of all of your cleaners and things. But... What you want to do is sort of, you know, make a list, go through this presentation and make a list of the things that are here. And, and many of these things apply to most of us. And, and I'm actually going through this whole process myself and water filter and, you know, air scrubbers and all that stuff. And, and you know, which we probably didn't cover in detail. Those are some topics we covered in other presentations. But the bottom line is that we have to clean up our environment. And so it's a really important you know, process, and I really want all of you to take this to heart because if you start to work hard in this area, in addition to 
you know, eating a natural, healthy, plant-based diet, which we recommended, fresh air, sunshine, and so on, you know, you're going to go a long way toward improving your health, and you may reverse a lot of things, and you will also, you know, prevent a lot of things down the road. So the sooner you start, the better off you are. Uh, it's not an overnight proposition, but it's something that uh, you have to take on. So, so Floyd, thanks a bunch. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I'm going to see you guys backstage as I close out. Uh, you know, great uh, presentation as always. Uh, I learned a lot. Okay, there you have it. Uh, another wonderful uh, bit of insight. Um, and again, you know, we hope you've learned a lot tonight. Uh, if you got a lot of this uh, presentation, if you're listening to this at this point, you probably did. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't. Uh, press the uh, thumbs up button and also share this with your friend. This is important information that we can all benefit from uh, and it will have a big impact on uh, all of our lives. So again, until next Monday, we want you to keep it fresh, natural, and live. Thank you.